Oh, that's not the hand again? No, no, don't. I okay. Queen Ellen's website. Okay. Like, you know, you're like, open up YouTube for the first time, and your Wi Fi is not good. It's like that. Well, we'll see how. We might have just recorded in high quality. You guys just post it. Yeah. And you just post it again. And I think it's probably Wi Fi. I could just hear it's terrible. Ever since I got my secure password, I've been on secure.
everyone. Thank you for joining us this Friday afternoon. And um, you'll meet our speaker from Kentucky and from FSU in a few minutes. But Michelle, our Dr. Staten from Kentucky commented, who would come to a lecture on such a beautiful day? So we're very impressed that you all are here. So thank you very much. It's the fourth in our series, uh, re our research lecture series. Um, featuring faculty from FSU as well as other universities. So thanks to the AME building staff, thank you for hosting us here today. It's a lovely, lovely auditorium. And welcome to students, faculty, community members, and also I'd like to welcome Abby Stoops, who is uh, part of our advisory council for the Center for the Study and Promotion of Family, Children, and Communities. So without you, this would not be possible. So thank you, Aggie, for being here. And with that, I just wanted to make sure everybody got flyers. They were at the end of the rows. There's also an evaluation form. So please snag those, fill those out. The evaluation form helps us to make sure that we're um, responsive to people's um, desire to learn. So with that, I'd like to introduce the Dean of the College of Social Work, Dr. James Clark. And one thing I was going to mention that we're live Facebook streaming this event and live tweeting. So be on your best behavior. Exactly. <laughs> I'm really pleased to uh, introduce these two wonderful speakers. Uh, Tanya Wren is an assistant professor in the College of Social Work, uh, and she's assistant director for the Institute of Justice Research and Development here at FSU. So Tanya began her career here at FSU, uh, but uh, in 20, uh, 2018, in the fall, uh, but she has a, a uh, doctorate from the University of Louisville, and did a NIDA, a National Institute of Drug Abuse, uh, postdoctoral fellowship at Washington University in St. Louis. So we're very fortunate to 
to have Tanya on our faculty. And one of the reasons why we were so interested in her being with us was not only her interest in criminal justice, but her interest in addiction science. And uh, so we're very, very pleased she's here. She's interested in the relational pathways that exist between uh, trauma and stress, high-risk behaviors, including substance use and high-risk sexual behavior, and well-being. And she's really interested in the criminal justice population, uh, especially because of her work with the IJRD. But um, we are also pulling on her expertise to think about uh, community-based uh, substance abuse research. So um, we're very, very happy to have her here. And uh, Michelle Staten, uh, Dr. Staten is an associate professor in the University of Kentucky Department of Behavioral Science, which is in the College of Medicine at UK, and faculty associate of the Center on Drug and Alcohol Research. And uh, her primary research interest is the delivering of screening and brief interventions uh, for substance use in non-traditional venues. Non-traditional venues, that's really cool. <laughs> which means in the places that social workers and people like people in this room work. So uh, she's PI for an ongoing study funded by the National Institutes of Health, National Institute on Drug Abuse to study drug abuse, risky sexual behavior, and HIV, HCV among rural women in Appa the Appalachia area of Eastern Kentucky. And in the spirit of full disclosure, uh, some of you know that I what, got my master's from UK and uh, taught at UK after getting my doctorate for 21 years uh, before coming here. And in the course of that 21 years, I was very fortunate to meet Michelle, who was a student, and uh, then went on and did doctoral work and is now uh, a, 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 an amazing researcher. And it, I was kidding. Uh, Tanya and Michelle that seeing the two logos up here has given me a little a heart palpitation uh, because I come to love FSU very much and I of course love the University of Kentucky. So to have a presentation on an issue that I care deeply about coming from these two universities and um, among two women I respect a great deal, uh, it's a great honor and pleasure. So. I'm not sure who's coming up first. Are you both coming up? Okay, so let's welcome uh, Dr. Michelle Staten first.
know that about 80%, like I've seen numbers as high as 90% in recent years, report lifetime history of drug use. And nearly two thirds of individuals who are incarcerated, and that's consistent across jails, prisons, different venues, actually would meet diagnostic criteria for substance use disorder. So why? What accounts for that huge overlap? Well, we know that use and possession of illicit substance is a crime in most, in most places. The sale and distribution of illicit substance is a crime. So we think possession and trafficking, those are obviously crimes. But also, so many individuals who have progressed into the more serious stages of their addictions also engage in a lot of illicit activity in order to sustain their drug use habits. Um, the crimes like a burglary are very common property types of crimes. So those are some of the primary reasons that there is this huge overlap between involvement in the criminal justice system and the severity of drug use. And we have a long and rich history of drug treatment and research in the city of Kentucky, which dates back to the 1935 to 1975 period where the U.S. Public Health Service operated a treatment program and research facility within the federal prison in Lexington, Kentucky. And um, I'm not sure if any of you know about this, this long and detailed history, but this was a time period where research was really exploding around addiction. And they had a lot of things right at this facility. Some of the things that we know today and we point to today around tolerance and withdrawal were actually done at the narcotic farm in the 1930s, 40s, 50s. Some of the things that we know about methadone treatment actually started at this facility. And, and learning things like addicts are not less intelligent than normal people. So they debunked a lot of these myths that were very common but they got some things wrong during this time also, particularly around the ethical treatment of prisoners as research subjects. And so some of the, the research that we learned about during that time was that we're criticized due to that. But they get a rich, rich history of drug treatment and, and research in the state of Kentucky. So we're gonna operate today when we think about that overlap between drug use and crime. We're gonna start with this very basic principle that drug addiction is a brain disease that affects behavior. Drug addiction is a brain disease that affects behavior. So as I eyeball the room today, most of you are probably too young to remember this terrible 1980s campaign, but some of you are smiling, so I know you remember it. So this was a sizzling hot skillet, and then eggs were breaking, and maybe it kind of exploded, and this is your brain, and then the eggs falling, and this is your brain on drugs. And the, those laughing in the room remember that. We all remember that. And this really happened and spun out of a, a time in our research where we were just exploding in neurobiology and addiction. And some of the things that we learn are still very, very relevant today. So we don't have time, obviously, this afternoon to go into a full lecture around the neurobiology of addiction, but there are some really inherent things that I want to bring to your attention when we think about the ways that drugs impact the brain. So obviously, different parts of the brain communicate to regulate everything that we do, and that happens through this very complex series of neurons, neurotransmitters, chemical receptors, transporters, transporter sites, and drugs really impact the way that all of those things work together, the communication network in the brain. And I want to show you this graphic where a lot of that behavior actually happens. The dopamine pathway, the pleasure pathway of the brain. All of the things that make us feel really good excite this pathway in the brain. Take food, for example. When you eat something that tastes really good, I understand there's a reception out here where all of our dopamine systems are going to be activated. Dopamine drops into this lovely little um, pathway, binds to some of the reception sites, dopamine gets to flow through them, and we all feel really good. That's how that happens. But when cocaine is on board, by comparison, dopamine floods that little pathway, binds to those reception sites, and continues to excite and fire in the brain. And over time, that activity can take a, quite a toll on different really critical areas of the brain. Take, for example, this brain on the left. This is a quote-unquote normal brain. 
a carrot two, the brain on the right, the brain in a chronic opioid user. So if you sit, think about this for a second in terms of a therapeutic situation. This would be the therapist's brain. This would be the brain of a chronic opioid user. There are some inherent deficits as you begin that process. Here's the slice, uh, slice of a brain from a chronic methamphetamine user. And these are critical areas of the brain associated with memory, emotion, cognitive functioning, which the red in this brain slice reflects a cell, a 5% cell volume loss of a chronic methamphetamine use over time. So again, I say all of this to say that long-term drug use has a significant impact on the brain, increasing the ability to feel pleasure, which is associated with tolerance and dependence, impaired cognitive memory functioning, and most important for our conversation today, an impaired self-control and decision-making processes, as well as the ways in which individuals might process punishment and reward, and most of us think about those things. So as we transition to talk a little bit about a specific study, so think about that in terms of why there's such a huge overlap between individuals who use drugs for long periods of time and end up in the criminal justice system. Much of that work is really focused primarily on men. Men, a much higher percentage of men in the criminal justice system than women, so it's much easier to unlawfully use their substance. So we have some, a lot of limitations you know, on what we know about women in these situations. A lot of this work is also focused on large urban areas where it's easier again, to target and identify and that's where usually the largest um, population living in, uh, in its transition back to so we wanted to focus our work on women who reside in rural areas, at least in Kentucky. And so let me share a little bit about this study. So this is the Appalachian Corridor of Eastern Kentucky. It sort of begins around here. And so you can see that the three counties that we were working in were situated perfectly within that Appalachian region. And we recruited women from three jails in Hazard, Hyden, and London, Kentucky. And we went to each of these jails on randomized days each month. We didn't want to always go in on a Tuesday afternoon. We didn't want to always go in on a Saturday morning. So at the beginning of each month, we actually randomly selected days to recruit each month. We went in on those days and randomly pulled women from the jail roster, whoever was residing in the jail on any given day, got to be involved in the study. And then among those women, we screened them for high-risk substance use using the NAGA modified assist. The ASSIST stands for Alcohol Smoking Substance Evolved Screening Test, and it can be administered easily by the research assistant. You don't have to have a clinical or person on staff to do that. Women who met criteria for the study were then uh, engaged in a baseline interview, HIV and hepatitis C testing, and a brief intervention. And our intervention targeted reduction of high-risk HIV and hepatitis C behaviors. So everyone in the study participated in the NAGA standard, and this is a, an educational intervention. What is HIV? What is hepatitis C? What are the risk behaviors associated with that? And how do I protect myself as I move to the community? Everybody got that information prior to engaging in HIV or hepatitis C testing. And then one other group of women got that intervention in addition to four sessions focused on the years to end. So for you specifically as a person in the study, what are your high-risk behaviors? Obviously not everybody's a drug injector, not everybody's exchanging sex for drugs, um, but whatever you see your high-risk behaviors being, how can we work with you to protect yourself as you re-enter the community? So during the course of about three, three and a half years, we recruited or randomly selected 900 women to be screened for the study and 688 of them actually went through the screening process. We lost a lot of women between being identified and screening because people get out of jail pretty quickly. So you can see you have to have a score of four or higher to be in our study, four or higher. And our highest average score was almost a 27 for prescription opioid misuse. But there were also using lots of things. So in essence, these are polysubstance using women. But this is a fairly high risk uh, assist score. And they were also fell into the high risk category, which was mostly indicative of drug ingestion. So of the six hundred
6,688 women who were screened, 97% of them met our subject use criteria of TSA. 97% had a score of at least four or higher. Randomly selected women were dropped in the study fail. So again, I mentioned earlier that about 80% of infants nationally in Utah have used lifetime substances. But these numbers actually surprise us, uh, and still continue to surprise us. So the 400 women who entered our study, the 688 was called down to 400 because they had to be in jail at least two weeks participate in reduction, but no longer than three months because we wanted to make sure they were within the general community. They were about 33 years old and mostly white, which is consistent with the Appalachian Corridor of Kentucky. Um, about a third were married, about 87% of them had children, less than a quarter were working prior to entering jail, and the majority of them, almost three quarters, reported having money or financial problems during that time. So similar to what we saw with the assist scores, this table represents sort of their breadth of substance use prior to being incarcerated. Again, you can see the majority of the women in our study had a long history of opioid use, and most, um, about 90% used in a year before they were incarcerated. So we started recruitment of the study right about the time when Oxycontin had been reformulated, so we weren't seeing quite as much of Oxycontin use, but we were still seeing huge amounts of Lortab, Percocet, um, really the, the misuse of prescription opioids, more than what you see here with heroin, and this is still pretty much the case in that, this area of our study. But again, poly substance users for the most part. This is the first study that I've been involved with since 1998, where opioid use was more common than alcohol and marijuana use, which have always been the most prevalent in all of our studies. And they weren't just using drugs. Again, we have a randomly <coughs> selected sample of women who were recruited based on drug use, but 75% of them had a history of lifetime injection. And they're primarily injecting, again, prescription opioids. So you can see the uh, injection patterns, both lifetime as well as recent use prior to coming into jail. Methamphetamines are making quite a comeback. I'm not sure what you all are seeing here, but we're seeing a gradual increase in methamphetamine use in Kentucky. As opioids become more and more difficult to get, we're really starting to see a gradual shift to more methamphetamine use. So again, our study focused on the reduction of high-risk behaviors associated with HIV and hepatitis C. We asked women in the study, has anybody ever told you you were HIV positive, as well as screening for HIV, and in actually as part of our study. We had zero women who had reported being HIV positive and screened positive through the course of our study. Hepatitis C, on the other hand, about a quarter already knew that they were positive, and about 60% basically screened positive as a result of our, as part of our study. And I was telling the DOC students earlier, we visit focus groups around this really early in the study. And they see this as, this is just what everybody has. Like it's just, it's just like having a cold in your hands. You, know, you could throw a rock and hit somebody who has hepatitis C. Like it's just very common in terms of what they understand about, especially the drug using networks in our community. So what did our intervention show? And I apologize, I realize this is probably very difficult to see. But this figure shows our key outcomes for the intervention we studied, looking at past month drug use, past month injection drug use, drug use before sex, using dirty needles and using dirty work, so high-risk injection behaviors. So what you're looking at here is on the left side of each of these figures are baseline data, and on the right side you're looking at three-month follow-up data. So across the board, you see significant reductions from baseline to follow-up for each of these core outcomes, which is exciting, right? However, the black bars represent our intervention group, and the white bars represent our comparison group. And we see basically no differences across any of these outcomes. And so what do we attribute that to? And when we talk to our women, what do you attribute that to? And they tell us this, what we know anecdotally is that they were so starved for education when we started their study, and there's so many misconceptions about the ways in which this was being transmitted, that the strength of our comparison group, where everybody got the notice they were 
everybody got some basic education about what is a dream, what is that dependency, and how are those things changing, that we believe that it attributes to some of the lack of differences between the two groups. Because in essence, this basically says that there could be some real advantages to delivering education in these facilities, but maybe not a huge additive value for actually an individualized and not during an initial interview when you have the intervention. So we are still continuing to analyze our six and 12 month data around some of these core outcomes. So at this point, I'm gonna transition the mic over to Dr. Wong, who's gonna talk a little bit more about this reentry period as individuals transition from incarcerated settings into the community. Thank you. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Um, so I'm excited to talk to you about what reentry looks like. What does this mean for those who are reentering? Um, we have a lot of very scary statistics, and I'll replicate some of those in a current study that I'm working on, um, but in case they didn't come across enough in Michelle's statistics. Um, but what we know is a majority of these people will release back into our communities. So they'll become our neighbors again. They'll become people in our cities. And so while we have a time and an intervention point while they are incarcerated in jail or prison, and a great time to help bring about interventions and different treatment options, um, we know that there's also this other phase um, that we can step into and really help individuals through. Annually, about 600,000 people are returning to our communities. Um, so that is not a small number. <laughs> um, about 98% of people eventually return to communities that they were initially pulled out of um, when they were incarcerated. And so we need to prepare people and help them during this phase. Another important thing to realize before we jump too much into reentry is that reentry starts inside. So Michelle talked about some of the overlap about talking to people three months prior to the release or prior to the release and the following of three months after. Reentry starts while they're still inside. Um, approximately six months, four to six months in advance uh, to the release, reentry planning typically occurs across most states. And then um, most programming lasts, well, it varies substantially, um, but up to a year is the most critical time that we follow people in reentry. So I just kind of want to set the stage. I know some of us are probably more aware about what reentry means and what it looks like than others, but just so we're all on the same page before we dive in. Um, specifically, we're looking at substance use at reentry. What does this look like for the individual? So, 63% of inmates, when thinking about reentry, say substance use treatment is a primary need. It is going to be vital to their success. Um, so, 63. But what we know is, um, when we look at opioid use disorder treatment, for example, about only 5% of people who actually are referred to that treatment receive it. So we're talking about a huge service treatment gap. Um, so people who are identified as needing treatment are not receiving it as they're returning to our communities um, across our nation. And why is this so important? Why is reentry such a critical time? Um, and so you'll see here on the second bullet point, um, there's a heightened risk of relapse, fatal and non-fatal overdose, uh, because people are returning. They think they can use the same amount of the substance that they used prior to incarceration. They go back, they take that amount, and what that does is lead a high rate of overdose. Death, um, the number one leading cause of death during reentry, looking at the 90 days post-release, um, is overdose, um, is something related to substances, followed by cardiovascular disease, homicide, and suicide, um, popping out the top four, and then I think most of us would argue substances were probably involved in um, homicide and suicide for most of those as well. Um, and recidivism rates, um, again, thinking really specifically about the 90 days, um, technical violations, rearrest, and reincarceration all coupled together. Um, and why does that happen when we think about reincarceration? Oftentimes, part of a release and reentry plan, um, returning prisoners are mandated to seek treatment um, and to demonstrate abstinence, uh, take drug tests, and attend 12 step or self help group sessions. Um, and so we kind of hinted at this. This is a brain disease. This is something that it takes a long time for someone to overcome. And if we're not rewiring the brain, how do we think someone's going to successfully just move through? And if we're not looking at um, high evidence-based interventions as well, and we're sending to self-help, how do we think someone's going to successfully move through reentry? So a little bit more about substance use treatment in the community. 
um, research among community corrections populations. Um, so not specifically those re-entering, but also including those on probation. So maybe they were never in jail or prison for a long stint. Um, psychoeducation is actually the most common treatment modality that people are recommended to, um, which has a really um, mixed effectiveness with this population or across the board for substance use disorder treatment. Um, and it's typically for those of low risk. So those who are less likely to overdose, those who are already less likely to recidivate, that's where we see the best outcome. So again, what we're providing to a majority of the people that we are providing services to is not even the most evidence-driven treatment um, that we could provide. Um, and there's reasons for this, right? It's like, well, if we know all this, why is this still happening? <laughs> um, how have we gotten ourselves into this? Um, but there are significant service barriers that we need to consider um, around reentry and around provision of services for those. And there's a supply and demand imbalance um, in that the recommended service provider that we had an amazing dinner last night, and I was talking to some service providers here in Tallahassee, and they're like, you're in the desert. <laughs> um, we're all serving the same people. They're being funneled through. We're trying to get them as connected as we can. Um, but still the need is just so great in comparison to what exists. Um, eligibility problems, um, some will not take sex offenders, certain kind of offenses will rule people out of certain types of treatments. Um, and so that's a huge um, treatment service gap that we see. Loss of insurance for <coughs> incarceration, inability to meet service costs, as you can expect, this is a population that um, doesn't have the funds to go to the top providers to receive the highest level of services, and if we're not meeting those needs, um, especially not being in an expansion state um, that helped expand those services, we see that gap continue to grow. Um, and then inadequate discharge, transition planning, and then just stigma towards addiction, which Ms. Michelle spoke a lot about when she opened up about the brain science, that we still have a large misunderstanding about what is actually happening to the brain and if um, we can get that information spread, that could help um, close the stigma around addictions. So I'm gonna share a little bit about a current study I'm involved in. This study is not specific um, to substance use disorder treatment, unlike Michelle's. Um, this study is actually focused around general reentry um, into the community, and it focuses on improving the well-being of those individuals um, who are re-entering and returning. So it's a large randomized control trial. Um, we're re recruiting participants across four different states within 50 state prisons. Um, and it's a longitudinal study. So we collect baseline data about three to four months prior to release. Um, T1, the time point one, occurs right upon release. So we can kind of get another baseline for those who are gonna receive our treatment once they release, as well as get um, baseline information on our control group. Our second time point in the community occurs at four months, the third at eight months, and the fourth at 15 months. This study is ongoing. Um, I'm primarily talking about baseline data today and a little bit of uh, T1, T2 um, data that we have. So this is an ongoing study, um, and it's actually part of a larger initiative. Um, so this is the pilot phase of even a multi-stage study that we're running. Um, but in addition to these uh, five different data collection points where we collect mainly quantitative data with some qualitative. Um, we are in continuous communication with participants where we collect more in-depth qualitative information about how reentry is going, um, what do services look like, is this what they expected to go into, um, and so we um, have built very tight relationships with some of our participants so we can kind of dig into some of these issues earlier on as this is phase one of a larger um, body of research we're moving forward on. Um, and in addition, we actually have the clinical staff um, are hired by us and they're staffed um, within each of the states that we're recruiting from. So we have the benefit of actually looking at their clinical notes too and actually talking to them about their experiences and hearing the stories and the perspectives of participants from them as they're hearing their stories. And so um, it's just a really great place for us to dig in, and I'm gonna share some of the information and data we have around um, substance use disorder specifically. Oh, so um, our sample is a little over 1,500 people. We sat down and met with 2,200 people. Um, about 17% were screened out and another 12% refused to participate. So um, not really bad numbers, but so that you guys know geographically where we are. <laughs> we're in Florida, Texas, 
Pennsylvania and Kentucky. Um, and within each of these four states, we have a more urban area and then two rural counties that we include as part of our population. Um, with the majority of our people, as Michelle hinted at earlier, um, returning to the more urban area and then the rural communities, anywhere from 50 to 100 people return to those as well. Um, so that's just a nice little breakdown. Um, we are not in Tallahassee. <laughs> Since I have a Tallahassee group here, we're actually in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, and then in Texas, we're in the Dallas area, in Pennsylvania, and Pittsburgh, and then in Kentucky, in Lexington. So a nice little overlap. So overall, across all four of our states, um, here's a little bit of demographics before we jump into their history of substance use, but 90% are male, um, so Michelle hinted at that. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of men who are incarcerated. Um, and this hits national trends, so usually around 10% are females. So we're seeing this in our four state sample. 50% um, identified as black, 33% identified as white. Um, about 43% have less than a high, sc less than a high school mm -hmm. education. Um, so kind of combing it all together and looking at it at the different phases. 65% were single, just a little over 10% were married at the time when we spoke to them, as well as 37, or uh, the average age was 37.4 years old. Um, when we talked to them, um, a lot of them, you know, very looking at incarceration history, have been in and out of the system since 18, so had only been in for a couple months on that one time that we spoke with them. So is across the board. Um, and then 60% screened um, with current substance use disorder in our sample. But to dig into this a little bit further, what did the history of the substance use disorder look like? So um, for ever use, um, the, the top, as Michelle also hinted at for our sample, was cannabis. Um, by far, these are not mutually exclusive. Um, they could use any or one or none of them. Um, and the second most likely was cocaine, and the third was opioid. What is interesting is that the most problematic 12 months prior to their incarceration, that maps exactly on. So with the first being cannabis, the second being cocaine, and the third being opioids. When we look at this, um, we see just a long history of substance use. And when we connect to what Michelle talked about earlier with the brain science and understanding as what has happened in the brain, how the brain has developed, um, we see that we're dealing with participants um, who have a long history of engaging in very, very lengthy substance use disorders. Um, and so at 12 months prior of our little, you know, our sample size, almost 1,100 people had used 12 months prior to, their, um, to that current incarceration. Um, so in terms of alcohol use, we, I separated it out um, for this presentation, uh, but about 49% had used alcohol um, three or more times um, within a three hour period on three or more occasions. Um, so we also see with the mix of illegal drug use, we're also seeing a high use of um, alcohol use disorder amongst these individuals. And then the average age um, for first time use was actually 14. So again, just getting to understanding as a brain disease, how it impacts for future decision making, these individuals are engaging with substances at a very young age, um, and they continue that engagement um, till the time they're incarcerated. So like I said, we have a great benefit in this study. Um, we have long-term relationships with these participants where not only do we get to collect quantitative, but we also have qualitative information around the substance use disorder. So I'm gonna share some of that. Um, some, and I'll point out what's from the participant view as well as what's from our clinician view. Um, but um, in short, being surrounded by drug use, especially when it occurred in their own families, provokes fear and worry, as some par participants noted. Um, and the direct quotes are in yellow. Um, they thought there'd be fewer temptations and staying clean would be easier. Um, and so this shows that this is probably someone who did not receive um, an intervention prior to release. They went in feeling really good. As most of us would feel when we know we're returning to our communities and our families, we would be elated and excited. Um, and you're just excited to return home and get into your normal. And so people focus on that, but what we see is sometimes the reality of what they end up having to face is missed until they're actually back in the community. So these are from people who have returned and this is how they're speaking about it to us. 
Um, one participant said, staying off the streets is hard. I know everybody, so it's hard to avoid bad influences. Um, another individual told us, not going back to the old environment. People expect me to go back, but I will not. So they're fighting against it too. They know um, people, places <laughs> um, will lead to the use of these substances. And so there is a recognition of the fight um, of having to combat it continually. Um, and in that, um, some will actually even choose to isolate themselves. So it's hard adjusting to going out in public. I feel more comfortable staying home. I don't wanna run into people I used to know because that will just lead to bad places and bad things. Um, but we also know isolation isn't an answer for someone returning. We know that social support, getting back out there, um, engaging in positive activities is what will actually lead to sustained recovery. Um, so while they're choosing to cope and trying to do what's best, we know that this will not have the sustainability that's needed to fight um, against their addiction. Um, and this is rather lengthy, um, but I thought it was really important because this is a story of success <laughs> for one participant that kind of turned bad, but thankfully for his support um, from his family, um, our clinician was able to work with it. So this is from the clinician's view. Um, one of our participants was released after serving two years for drug charges. He has a long history of severe drug addiction and has been in and out of incarceration for much of his life. He is committed to sobriety and wants to remain in recovery as he is now aware of the pain and suffering that he caused his family. His wife is extremely supportive of him and all of his efforts to change. So the participant was recently hired for a labor job and has enjoyed the work. He texted the five key practitioner immediately when he was hired to share the good news. On Saturday, however, they received, the clinician received several calls from the wife. The participant had received his first paycheck, check, paycheck, excuse me, and after cashing it, had gone to purchase a new crack. So he binged, he totally binged out, and thankfully, <laughs> um, the wife communicated with us. Um, but the wife and the participant were together. The three of us worked extensively to find a residential treatment and detox facility in a nearby community that would admit him. We helped him to contact his corrections-based treatment counselor and parole officer to ensure that he would not be found in violation of parole and demonstrate that he admitted himself into the residential treatment um, center. So this is an amazing story, right? It came full circle, the wife was able to step in and help out, but that shows, right? We talk a lot about employment, but again, <laughs> at the first paycheck, the wife was expecting him home to give a little bit more background. The wife was expecting him home. He didn't show up. He went missing for a couple hours, then eventually showed up, and had totally just spent the whole paycheck. Um, but luckily, his wife had a good relationship also with our counselors, and she was able to step in and help. Um, while this is one story, this is not a single story. <laughs> um, this is the story of many of our participants. And getting employment and having meaningful work trajectories is something that's really important for the individuals that we support um, but you can see how hard it is, even with accountability and family support for these individuals to fight off addiction upon returning to the community. Um, and also in this qualitative data, we've gotten a hint at location um, and time barriers for individuals. Um, so again, um, I work with one participant who lives in a rural community, far from our offices. He has a history of drug addiction that has been sober for the four years of his incarceration and is committed to maintaining his sobriety after release. He was able to quickly acquire a job and soon after release was working long days, five or six days. He attends an intensive outpatient substance use treatment program three nights a week after work required by parole. Unfortunately, he has to commute almost an hour home after treatment to his rural home. Um, and this isn't just for those who are in rural communities. Um, so like I said, we're in Dallas. In Dallas, you don't cross interstates is what we're learning. We're in Pittsburgh. In Pittsburgh, you don't cross the rivers. <laughs> um, and so even if we have these on every single corner, um, for people who have limited transportation or have, who are trying to step back into work, trying to step back into um, taking care of their children, um, time and location of these facilities is really an issue to treatment pr provision, especially right upon reentry during one of the most sensitive periods to have success with a participant, an individual. Um, and so last but not least, um, so some of our participants are released actually to controlled environments, right? So these are some of the most high risk that we know they're gonna struggle going back, um, and not by our account, but by Department of Corrections account, they're actually released to treatment facilities. Um, but what we're seeing in this very interesting theme is that even there, the success is hard, which I'm sure is not 
very surprising to some individuals, but to hear it in their voice um, and to see where the struggle still is, um, even when they're released into this environment, that they're supposed to be rather protected um, from substance use. Um, so one challenge in being here is being here around all the drug use. It's not like I didn't expect it, but it's hard. I'm on paper, so it makes me nervous to be around that, so meaning they're scared to get reincarcerated um, because they're close to these substances. I don't want anything to jeopardize what I got going on. Um, and another participant talks about the same struggle, where the residents are using, where they're around it, potentially more, um, but this is where they were discharged to, um, and where they, as a step in the reentry process, that they're actually supposed to be more safe um, and staying away and fighting off their addiction. Um, so what does this lead us with, um, based on Mich what Michelle shared, as well as myself? Um, it's a brain disease. It's something that changes the wiring in a person um, that takes a long time to overcome. Um, in that we see the, um, sorry, I was jumping ahead of myself, sorry. Um, and drug users have an increased likelihood of entering the criminal justice system. So we shared statistics that show well over 90% in both of our samples have used illegal substances as well as have, have abused alcohol um, for a rather long time in their life and that they did this up to the time of incarceration. Um, but we believe that these could provide some of the ideal venues for interventions. Um, not only, you know, we started off with a quote, Michelle started off with a quote, um, but they are becoming a main behavioral health <laughs> um, delivery setting and we need to step into that and we need to make sure we're delivering the highest evidence-driven interventions that we can to these populations. But um, with the rewiring of their brain, right, there's resiliency of their brain and so this might be a time to actually elect to make sure we're doing the best that we can for this population. Um, and not only that, but reentry is critical in sustaining the um, gains in corrections-based treatment. So if we start inside and we end immediately upon release, um, when someone's returning to their community, we're missing a prime opportunity. Um, and what the statistics show is that we currently have a treatment gap as well as um, we're not doing um, the diligence we could for these individuals whose lives are at a heightened state at this time. So that's what we have for you today. So we did leave 10 minutes for yes. questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so thank you so much. You wanna come up for the questions? Yeah. And thank you guys so much. For
overdose prevention and people that are interacting with. But it was not given in the jail as a resource at the time of recruitment nor as they transitioned out. But it is happening. Um, the uh, jail officials, jail uh, correctional officers are now trained to use it. It is available at the jail because a lot of times people come in high risk for overdose right. and these in dangerous detox, dangerous early things in the jail. So um, we've made a lot of strides and a lot of progress around uh, the delivery of trauma and things like that. So it's a good we've question. We've been behind, but now we're starting yeah. to get it in all the jails. We have more staff working with a couple years ago, one board, and slowly but surely we're trying to get in. That's great. And our probation parole officers in Kentucky as well have all been trained to use it, and it's available. So, good question. We actually just had, um, Ellen and I just had a conversation with somebody who mentioned that also occurring here in Florida and raised our attention to it. So we're kind of in, I'm in an exploratory phase about it, but I don't actually have anything right now. But I'd love to connect once I have time to look into it. There are some early research trials. I know a researcher at Kentucky is um, engaging in some medication trials around the as far as I know, we're very far away from actually those being released, FDA approved and being released, but there are some early trials that he's working on that. It's a difficult population, and it's um, it's a really good question, mm -hmm. so. Um, it's really good. Yeah, and it's something we're gonna have to start paying attention to very quickly, because it's rising quickly. I've also heard about um, poly substance use with the opioids. So when I started looking into it, that people are actually using those two hand in hand. Um, and so I think that's another interesting question. So I don't know if anybody else has thoughts yeah. about it, but I'm seeing that more and more too in the statistics. I, I was actually gonna say that as well, just open it up to the room. Are provide other providers in the room? Anybody got a good handle on how this is going? Getting treatment purchased from Lisa has the answer. Oh, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but I have a question. Yeah. So what would your what would your ask for social workers and practitioners be based on the information here? So what can we do as individual social workers, social work educators, and practitioners in the community with this knowledge that you're sharing? <laughs> um, so what I would recommend is that we need to step in to it. Number one, I think when we're talking about corrections based work social work hasn't always been to the table. And so I think there's an obvious answer that um, social workers need to find a way to weave themselves into corrections-based work more and more, be it jails, re-entry settings, or prison. So that's number one. Um, but the second is um, how, so I know we have providers and community people in here, um, but those who are meshed in the criminal justice system usually end up receiving services from all of you community providers, be it that they end up homeless, they end up with needing mental health services, healthcare services, and so the population is actually being seen by a whole host of individuals who are not necessarily educated on all the intersectionality of it. And so when I think about social work education, I think about making these connections. Um, because we started hinting at the high-risk sexual behavior, we didn't really connect trauma, but I know both Michelle and I have a huge passion with the intersection with trauma and substance use disorder for those in our criminal justice system. And so I think it's helping connect these dots um, because we all end up seeing some of these people who have cycled in and out of the doors or the population that Michelle and I talked about. Um, but helping social workers sort of going out, um, be it that they don't think they're gonna touch it or not and educating around that. Um, I even think school-based social work with those who end up in the juvenile justice thinking the school to prison pipeline, but also parents who end up incarcerated and um, equipping our social worker student, our social work students to understand um, what's actually happening for these individuals and what to expect. I agree with all of that. And I think the one thing I would add is with the growth of the opioid epidemic in 
use of vocabulary in the Eastern Kentucky area, um, particularly. We really started to see a huge shift in the way that criminal justice officials think about things like this. They no longer, I think, have the luxury of saying, that's not my problem, because all of the jails and prisons are exploding with individuals who have problems with substance use, and particularly opioid abuse. And like I said, we really started to see a nice gradual shift in that, okay, you're gonna participate in a program on the inside, and now you're gonna be released to probation parole. We need to do some wraparound services in that area. We have a new reentry division in Kentucky where there's a reentry coordinator in each probation parole office, and most of them are social workers. And they're working on things like employment. We found in one of our studies that if a person gets out and gets a job, they're five times less likely to go back. So employment is huge. Uh, and who better to do things like that than social workers because they see a much bigger picture than, uh, than a parole officer who often sees, you drop dirty, you need a consequence. And I'm sorry, I use bad terms. <laughs> a person who uses drugs who had a negative urine screen <laughs> is most likely to go back. And so, um, so I think who better to do that work than social workers? It's a huge, complicated picture. And I think that that, that really is where we, we really need to just funnel services. It's a really good question. And I was telling somebody at dinner last night, um, we had an inside out class at Kentucky where we took social work students into the prison. And so we had like 15 UK students who took a semester class with 15 prison units. And for the first time, it was this realization that, wow, these are people who mm -hmm. have made some bad decisions. They're not inmates. and so. I think just sort of changing the way that even though we're social workers and we're supposed to think you know, this wonderful value of everyone, but we still have some inherent stigma around some of these problems that I think are really important to have some honest conversations about in, in classrooms. So. Um, given that the U.S. prison system differs so much from prison systems in other countries, I'm wondering, have there been any cross-national studies on the link between substance use and incarceration? Uh, not, uh, do you know? okay. <laughs> I was going to say, so there's a, so Dr. Tripodi here <laughs> has, does some international work, and so this, I can speak a little bit just from listening to him. Um, I don't think there's a lot of international studies that, com we compare population numbers, right? And we also know the Western European model, is it Western Eastern? Oh, now that I just said Western, I'm doubting. Um, <laughs> but what, a European model is much better. So there actually are states here um, in the United States that are adopting that model, that are actually trying to change the whole structure of Department of Corrections, um, not in Florida, let me make that clear. Um, <laughs> but there is a Midwestern state that has gone over and actually studied it intensively, and they're trying to see um, what does it look like to implement that kind of model here within a state Department of Corrections. Um, so nothing specific to the lo looking at intersection of criminal justice and substance use disorder, I've never come across it, and I think it is kind of an area of research that we could expand on. Um, but what we do see is that there's elevated rates of substance use disorders, um, addiction, mental health, also in their uh, population that are involved in the criminal justice system internationally. Um, but no really in-depth dive into um, looking across the different countries. Is there any, has anyone tried to figure out if the criminal justice system could be actually perpetuating that substance abuse disorder given that there is that association? Because it seems like everything is looking at it So research, I can't speak to. There's, that's a really good question. Um, I truly do not know any research um, around that question specifically. What I can say is that we know incarceration in and of itself is a traumatic experience. Um, being picked up and moved to another community and we know trauma increases the rate of substance use disorders and so if we're not successfully treating it, then we're perpetuating the cycle. Um, and so um, I've been a part of previous studies where we actually asked, you know, about 20 different about 20 different traumatic experiences, and it was what was the worst and incarceration um, far outnumbered other very traumatic experiences. So if we truly do know that trauma increases the rate of substance use disorders, 
um, and mental health complications, it's hard for us to say that we're not perpetuating it if we're not actually utilizing it as a time to prevent and treat future engagement in the substances. So that's more of a personal reflection, less on like what the literature says, because um, I don't know if anyone's actually taken that angle on it. Well, I think it, oh, oh, one oh, last question, go ahead, I'm sorry. <laughs> Has anyone focused on the kids of these uh, jail or incarcerated uh, parents, especially the women who tend to be the providers? <laughs> <laughs> we haven't. Um, we, about, like I said, about 87% of our women have kids. And what we're seeing, at least in the Appalachian area, is that we have this explosion of grandparents who are now raising their grandkids. And that's creating quite a financial burden and a resource burden for those individuals, but we haven't actually studied the kids, so to speak. That was, your, was that your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, a, it's a good one. It's very important, I think. Yeah.